Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing clathrin-mediated endocytosis and the endocytic pathway. Okay, right, so we were talking about calmodulin, and we've seen these EF, EF dimers that uh, each of the lobes of calmodulin has, which allows it to bind two calcium ions. Now, the structure I've drawn here, with this sort of hunched over structure here, this is the structure of the calmodulin when it has no calcium bound to it. And the structure which has no calcium bound to it is often known as apocalmodulin. Okay, so calmodulin with no calcium bound to any of these four sites is known as apocalmodulin. And the shorthand for apocalmodulin is to call it apocan, like this, where you have this capital C, lowercase a, capital M. APOCAM also is just the shorthand for calmodulin. This capital C, lowercase a, capital M is the shorthand for calmodulin. Okay, right. Now, when four calcium ions bind to the apocalmodulin, what happens is the apocalmodulin changes its structure. So, firstly, it becomes less, um, less hunched over. Okay, so what happens effectively is these two things move outwards apart from one another. And in contrast to uh, the whole molecule sort of straightening out, the polypeptide linker between the two lobes, which was initially a linear polypeptide uh, that was linking them, now becomes alpha helical. So I'll draw this as a spring-like shape here. So this is an alpha helix here linking the two lobes of calmodulin. So this alpha helix here. Okay, and now these two lobes have both got two calcium ions bound to them. So let me show this by colouring in those calcium binding sites here. So here's a calcium bound here, here's a calcium bound here, here's a calcium bound here, and here's a calcium bound here. So this now is what's known as a calcium Ca2 plus calmodulin complex. Okay, or uh, for short, calcium calmodulin complexes can be denoted Ca2 plus C-A-M, using the shorthand for calmodulin again. Okay, now, calcium calmodulin complexes have a very different uh, interaction profile than apocalmodulin. So these calcium calmodulin complexes are going to go and activate other enzymes or other proteins in the axon terminal. So let's now go on to another piece of paper and see this. Okay, right. So, what is the calcium calmodulin going to activate? Well, it's going to activate um, an enzyme known as calcineurin. Okay, so just to summarise what we've done so far, because we've had a very long discussion about calmodulin, and that was just to make sure that you have uh, some intuition on calmodulin. But fundamentally, what I've said so far is that when an action potential arrives in the axon terminal, calcium is going to go up, calcium is going to bind to calmodulin, and now the calcium calmodulin complex is going to bind to something else. So there's not that many steps that we've gone over yet. It's just I put a lot of background information in. Okay, to give you hopefully some intuition for what these molecules actually are. Right, so here is our calcium calmodulin complex here, binding to this enzyme. Okay, so let's just put the calcium ions bound there. So one, two, three, four. Okay, so with, what is the name of this enzyme that I've drawn the calcium calmodulin complex binding to? Well, this is an enzyme known as calcineurin, and basically it is a serine threonine phosphatase. So it removes phosphate groups from serine and threonine residues of amino of sorry of proteins. Serine threonine phosphatase. So it's the opposite basically of a serine threonine kinase. So, what protein is it going to target? Oh, well, basically, I need to tell you what calcium calmodulin is going to do firstly. It's going to activate the calcineurin. So, the calcineurin was inactive. Once the calcium calmodulin complex binds to the calcineurin, the calcineurin is going to become active. So, it's going to start removing phosphate groups from serine and threonine residues of proteins. Now, in the cytoplasm of our axon terminal, Okay, let me draw this here. So here's our axon terminal. This calcineurin enzyme is now going to be active. And basically, there is a protein, which I'll draw here, 
which has a phosphate group stuck on it, usually. When the cell is at rest, i.e. when it's not having an action potential arriving, and there's no calcium signal, then this protein usually has a phosphate group bound to it. So let's have the phosphate group in red here. So this dot on the side, this is the phosphate group. And the protein is a protein known as dynamin-1. Okay, so here comes dynamin-1. And this protein is going to be really important. This is what's going to pinch off the vesicle with help from another little protein. But this is the most important one. This is going to do the job. Okay, so at the moment it's got a phosphate group on. And that phosphate group is stopping it from pinching off vesicles. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, you can understand now. This calcineurin enzyme is going to go and it's going to chop that phosphate group off. So it's going to go and act on this and it's going to basically chop that phosphate group right off that dynamin 1 protein. So you now have dynamin 1, which I'm suddenly going to start denoting as a circle rather than a square, but never mind. Uh, so here's dynamin 1 that now no longer has. Uh, the phosphate group bound to it. So this is dynamin 1. Don't think that I'm drawing the phosphate here because I'm drawing a circle. I'm drawing it as a circle because of what's going to come next. It's easier to draw it as a circle. So this is a cartoon drawing. This isn't what it actually looks like. Okay, this is to get the general principles across. So, basically, when the calcium signal arrives, it's going to result in the activation of dynamin 1. That's how you can summarize everything we've just looked at. Dynamin-1 is now going to help the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. So let's remember where we were. Here is our membrane, and we have so far formed a clathrin-coated vesicle bud. So we've formed this bud in the plasma membrane, which basically has uh, the clathrin, which I don't want to show in purple because the dynamin-1 is in purple. Uh, the clathrin can be in this turquoise color. The clathrin is now coating this clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Okay, and we need some help now in um, pinching off this neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Okay, so what's going to happen is now that dynamin-1 is active, it's going to start attaching onto this neck here. So here's one dynamin-1 protein, and it's going to start oligomerizing. It's going to start joining with other dynamin-1 proteins, and what they're going to start doing is they're going to start wrapping around the neck of the vesicle. So you're going to start continually assembling this complex, and it's going to wrap around in a spiral, basically. So I can't show you the dynamin-1 proteins going around the back of the neck, but basically it goes along here, and it's going to go round the back, and then it's going to come back round up here. Okay, so it's making these spirals around the neck of this clathrin-coated vesicle bud here. Okay. Now, there is another protein which is also believed to be slightly involved in this, um, this um, pinching off of the vesicle. And the other protein, which I'm just going to mention briefly now, is a protein known as endophilin. Okay, so here's endophilin. So endophilin, basically, is a protein which dimerizes with a friend. So here's one endophilin protein, and they dimerize together, basically, like so, to make a sort of banana shape, okay? So here are these endophilin proteins, which we'll have in orange here. Okay, let me try and keep this nice and straight. Okay, so what role is the endophilin protein... Uh, dimer going to have uh, with pinching off this neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. So let me just label this up. This is the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Okay, right. So basically what's going to happen is that the endophilin protein, which is in these dimers already, is going to start uh, joining together with more endophilin dimers, so that what you're going to start producing is these whole rings of endophilins. So you can see that the endophilin protein has this um, this um, uh, curvature to it. Okay, so what you can imagine is joining more of them together, and basically forming a ring of endophilin proteins here. Okay, so 
basically that's what you do. You form these rings of these of this endothelin protein, and you form these rings around the neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud here. So you form rings of endothelin protein around the neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Okay, right, and that also helps in this pinching off process. And to help uh, the endothelin with this process, what it has is on this concave aspect of this endothelin dimer here, Basically, what you find is a lot of positively charged uh, amino acid residues, okay? So the charge density is that you have a high positive charge in this concave portion here. And basically, that's the portion that's going to have to wrap around this uh, phospholipid neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Phospholipids, the heads of phospholipids, have negatively char negative charge. So this positively charged concave portion of endothelin is going to interact very nicely with the uh, phosphate heads of the phospholipids in that neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Okay, so basically you're going to get these rings of endothelin proteins also around the um, the neck. So let me show some of these maybe. I'll put them in between the um, dynamin 1 protein. So I've just put an orange line there to represent the endothelin ring. Okay, so um, both the dynamin 1 and the endothelin are going to wrap around the neck of the clathrin coated vesicle bud. And of the two, dynamin 1 is more important. Remember, if you knock this out, um, if you knock this out in Drosophila, you get what's known as the Shibiri mutant Drosophila, okay? And these Drosophila, which by the way are fruit flies, so I'll put this here, there, uh, it's a Drosophila and it's just a type of fly, basically. These flies are completely paralyzed and they don't live for very long, therefore, okay? Uh, they, um, if you look at their neurons after they've died, then basically what you see is absolutely loads of clathrin coated vesicle buds that just cannot actually pinch off. So what you'll see, if, if we draw a little axon terminal here, you'll have absolutely loads of clathrin coated vesicle buds, but they can't pinch off. So the first portion of clathrin mediated endocytosis occurs, but the final portion involving the dynamin 1 protein just doesn't occur. And that's why uh, neurotransmission fails. Because, basically, you can't make synaptic vesicles because you just can't get the membrane out of the cell membrane to make the synaptic vesicles. So you can't uh, have any sort of neurotransmitter release and it causes major problems in these flies. So dynamin 1 is the more important of these two proteins. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.